Well, brethren, this afternoon uh, is a real blessing. We are going to be going through the days of Daniel, the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335 days. Um, the way we're breaking this up uh, for the beginning of the 1260 days, the fleeing of the church to the wilderness, we're asking Brother Obi Albert to treat that portion. Uh, for the closing of the 1260 days in 1799, uh, the coming back from the wilderness, we've asked uh, Brother Brian Montague to take and treat that section. Uh, examining doctrine and prophecy, the 1290 days, uh, will be Brother Jim Parkinson. And the blessings of those in the 1335 days, uh, that will be our dear brother Tom Ricciarello. So first in the way of uh, introduction, uh, you know, we recognize that these days of Daniel are directly linked back to Elijah prophesying that there would be no dew nor rain, but according to his word. And so um, this is the type, this is the beginning of this significant number of 1260 days. And indeed it is significant. Um, I'll show you how we take Daniel 726 and come up with 1260 days, but we find that it's mentioned in Revelation four times. Each time uh, we can see the direct link back to the period of the prophecy of Elijah. So I'm showing that on the screen. Uh, you can see for Revelation 12, 14, how the exact quote from Daniel of time, times, and half a time gives us 1260 days. And the way we're organizing this, the panel has been asked to keep their words to around 10 minutes. Uh, I'll show up one minute before that wraps up. Uh, to just encourage them to, you know, in, in case things are going a little slow. And then we hope to have five minutes of discussion before moving to the next section. So with that, um, we will, I will stop sharing the screen and uh, I'll ask um, for our brother Obi to take over. Well, thank you, Brother Richard, <clears throat> for your comments and your direction in this discussion. You know, certainly the Brotherhood is considering deeply about where we are on the stream of time and uh, going back and looking at some of our foundational understandings of Daniel and the days of waiting, I think will be very encouraging to all of us. So my assignment is the fleeing into the wilderness. The woman flees into the wilderness for three and a half years. And why does she have to flee? Well, we all know from our studies that the uh, rise of papal power and the hegemony of the papacy over all the Christian churches really forced the hand of those true believers in Christ, those dear brethren who stayed fast to the scriptures and did not consider that a marriage or association to a uh, hierarchical church was appropriate. And actually we've seen replays of that uh, consistently through church history as one movement uh, arises out of another that uh, leaders rise up and uh, take control of the general masses of the people. So the fleeing into the wilderness I think is alluded to <clears throat> in Revelation chapter 12, um, where we have a woman that is generally interpreted to be the gospel church. And having given birth to a son who is to rule the nations with a rod, rod of iron, uh, her child was caught up to God and his throne or exalted to godlike power and rulership over the other churches. And odd that this woman, this loving mother, then feels it necessary to flee into the wilderness. Verse 6 of Revelation 12. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, very similar to the Elijah picture, 
so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. I think my role today is more uh, focusing on the beginning of these days of waiting, the time when the woman would have to flee into the wilderness. One moment, scrolling here. In Daniel 7, we're given a vision of the most terrible of the four universal empires. Beginning with verse 6, <clears throat> I'm sorry, verse 7. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and I think the major difference is, is that this was not just a political system or a monarchical power, but it was a, an ecclesiastical governing power. And that feature of ecclesiasticism is what set it apart from the previous three horns that were pulled up by the roots before it. This little horn possessed eyes <clears throat> like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. And so on it goes. Um, and that one was to rule for a time, times, and a half a time. So during that period, uh, verse 25, he will speak out against the most high and wear down the true saints. I added the word true. He will wear down the true saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So as we approach the days of Daniel, our focus is not so much on when these days began, or I would say our scriptures don't show us absolutely when these days began, but we can take the most significant of those time periods, the 1260 days, and try to place that in history. And I think that it's very uh, historically uh, documented that the Roman church's power was broken by Napoleon when he took the Pope captive and essentially showed his ascendancy over the Roman church, bringing its rule of over a thousand years to an end. So taking 1799, the great flood of truth that began to be poured out at that time, uh, the great uh, liberty that Christians began to enjoy, uh, the subsequent uh, rise of the Bible societies just a few years after that, um, I think confirm the validity of 1799, but we'll get more into that later. So if we take 1799 as our starting point or ending point, we do simple math to get the beginning point, And that is to subtract 1260 from 1799, which brings us to the year 539 AD. Now, what was significant about 539? Can we find some marvelous world event that would underscore our understanding of Daniel chapter 7 and the, the days of waiting. Well, there's nothing really cataclysmic except the ruler, um, essentially, of the uh, Roman territory was, address, was Pope John. He was the patriarch or the, uh, the chief bishop in Rome. And Emperor Justinian wrote him a letter the victorious Justinian, the devout, the fortunate, the renowned, the triumphant, the ever august, to John, the most holy archbishop of the fostering city of Rome and patriarch. Well, Justinian was not living there. He was far off in Constantinople, and the situation in Rome had gotten very grave. They had been attacked by the Visigoth armies and the Ostrogoths. And at the time of the writing of this edict, the Ostrogoths, uh, 
polity was in charge of Rome. But Justinian gave power of attorney, as it were, to uh, Pope John, saying this. At present, then, we've held it necessary that there come to the notice of your holiness the matters which are in commotion, however plain and certain they are, and however firmly they have always been guarded and declared by all the priests according to the doctrine of your apostolic see. For we do not permit that any question be raised as to anything which concerns the state of the churches, however plain and certain it be, that be not also made known to your holiness, who is the head of all the holy churches. For in all point, points, as has been said, we are eager to add to the honor and authority of your see. Well, in 539, the Roman general Belisarius attacked the Ostrogothic army uh, at Rome and routed them and proceeded north to their capital, Ravenna, which was taken in 540. So in 539, there was a setting up in power of the Roman church. Now, there are two criteria that need to be met. Um, the first is that the abomination that maketh desolate would be created. And the second is that the, uh, I'm just checking my time here. The second is that it would be set up. So if I were going camping, I have a tent, it exists, it's in existence. But when I take it out of the package and I set it up, then it is of utility to me. And that's the case here. Uh, it's not the doctrine of the mass, as we often think, that uh, is the beginning point of the 1260 days or the days of Daniel. It is the setting up in power of those which administered the rites of uh, the mass. So that's how it came to pass. Um, again, it's not a, a date that we have in scripture identified so soundly, but it is a date that we know when it ends by very powerful historic testimonies. And so from 539, we have our 1260 days, the 1290 days, and the 1335 days. And thank you, Brother Richard, for your chairmanship. Well, thank you, Brother Obi. That is a wonderful uh, introduction to uh, the beginning of this period. I know that the uh, other panelists are here as co-hosts. I wondered if there were any uh, comments. Uh, I would, I, I will start with a comment though, uh, just to, to get us going. Um, recently, it's been observed that there was, um, there have been statements to the effect that this period of time might have been possibly one of the worst times you could ever live in Europe this period between 535 and 539, uh, because um, there was a very uh, significant volcanic eruption that created crop failure, which created famine, which was followed by plague. And, and uh, consequently, you know, just holding on to power was not easy. You know, why did, why did the Eastern emperor give over power to the Pope? <laughs> well, anyway, a um, couple interesting things there, but I don't want to dominate. Uh, anybody else on the panel have any comments on the beginning of this period? Brother Richard? Yes, Brother Tom. No, one, one of the mistakes that William Miller made, although he was very close in his application of these prophecies, was that he was so fixed on 1844, 1845, that he took these and went backwards. And so he got three different starting dates. But scripturally, is that wasn't authorized. And of course, hindsight is easy to say that. But I think the text that helps us most is in Daniel 12, verse 11. Because this whole section, of course, is about the three, three periods of time. Uh, this is where it tells us where to start. In verse 11, it says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and 
the abomination that maketh deathless shall be uh, 1,290 days. And, and he says, blessed is he that waited at the 1335. Well, this is the point that there were two events that had to occur before the counting could start. The daily sacrifice would be taken away. And of course, the brethren have identified that as the mass that was established in 381. But that's not where you start because that's only one. And then you've got the second when the abomination was set up. And that, of course, is in 539, as Brother Obi said, when Justinian established papacy in the Roman civil law, which meant that no emperor after him could take it out because it was established in the law. There's one other point I'll make. I know we want to brief, uh, keep this brief. There is a series of four volumes by Edwin Frome, who was a, an Adventist, and he agrees with our application right down the line. But what he does is he gives us a lot of historical information uh, that Brother Russell just doesn't have room for in the volumes. And these are very helpful and very supportive. If I could just read just a couple of short paragraphs from there. Sure. This is volume one, page 508. He says, in Justinian's code are incorporated edicts of former emperors in favor of the Roman church and in the celebrate, celebrated novella or new laws the canons of the former general councils are turned into standing laws for the whole empire. That's the key. And then on the next page, 509, and here's where the wilderness becomes a necessary event for the church. Uh, it says from about 539, the sovereign pontiff and the patriarchs began to have a corps of officers to enforce their decrees as civil penalties began to be inflicted for their, by their own tribunals. So not only did papacy get entrenched in Roman law, they had an army to make sure people followed it. And Justinian was very conscious of wanting to have everyone believe the same. And so when you go to Revelation 13, it's extraordinary that it says the, uh, the, the dragon gave power to the beast. It wasn't won in a war, it was given. And so I think history backs it up that 539 is the point because that's when the law was written that incorporated papacy into the Roman law. Okay, thank you, Brother Tom, and thank you for pointing out to the brethren. Get get out your copy of From if you it's free online, actually, brethren. And it actually it's, has the wording of all those novellas, so you can see what the wording was. It's really good. Yeah, very good. Uh brethren, at this point, we're going to ask uh our brother Brian Montague to uh, look at the section of the prophecies in Daniel now that take place after the 1260 days. And there's so much that happened in between, we can't talk about that. We're just going to pick up with this period at the close. So Brother Brian. Hey, one second, uh, let me try that again, hang on. Stop share. Okay. There may be a little overlap with uh, Brother Obi's remarks, but uh, we'll bring it up anyway. That'll be fine. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> In um, Daniel 12, 8, uh, we know that the prophet states in part, and I heard, but I understood not. We mentioned that because had we lived during the time that Daniel was divinely inspired to write these words, or even have up until the time of our Lord's return, our sentiments would likely be the same. So uh, I am particularly appreciative of the harvest message, which helped aid our understanding of this important lesson that the Phoenix brethren have asked for us to consider on the days of Daniel. Uh, indeed, we are now living there in the times of Daniel 12, 10, where the wise shall understand. And um, there's much that we could say on this, but we'll try to be as succinct as possible given the time limitation before us. So again, we thank Brother Obi for his remarks on the events that lead to the start of the 539. Uh, this is a date where we understand from Daniel 12, 11, that we can begin to mark the time that the discernment of Christ's ransom sacrifice was suppressed and supplant it with the formal institution of the mass. Uh, therefore, by that point, the abomination that make it desolate, the papacy was set up in power in Rome. Now, the portion we're commenting on is the 1260. 
in the interest of time, we trust there's an overall acceptance to the scriptural teaching of a day for a year from Ezekiel 4, 6. Therefore, when speaking of the 1260 days, we are prophetically referring to 1260 years, a time period which is captured or even hidden in, uh, in the scriptures in several places, notably as Brother Richard pointed out in Revelation in Daniel. So to that end, we'll examine a couple of these verses at least to hopefully better understand what is taking place. Uh, for our first consideration of the 1260, we wanna look at the book of Revelation and specifically the 12th chapter where John the Revelator characterizes this period from the book of Daniel. Uh, we know that for most students of prophecy, I think it's generally understood and agreed that Revelation has three main sections corresponding to three periods of time, chapters one to 13, primarily dealing with the gospel age as a whole, 14 to 19, largely dealing with the events of the gospel age harvest, in 20 to 22, mainly dealing with the Messianic age. So our, our consideration of Revelation 12, we find that the text in these verses primarily address events specific to the gospel age, but before the harvest incepts. Oh, okay, we wanna now look at Revelation 12 and we'll read verse six, which says as follows. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, at the beginning of this described period, the table had previously been set by Constantine, the emperor, emperor of Rome, who brought an end to the persecution of Christians through his issuing an edict, declaring Christianity a state religion, while allowing numerous heathen idols to take hold, thus corrupting the purity of the gospel something the apostle indicated would take place in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 11. As such, when 539 AD arrived, the woman or early church who through that time had struggled with the apostate church was formally pushed into a wilderness or outcast condition. In other words, spiritually separated from the papacy. And just like the prophet Elijah had to flee from Jezebel, the antitypical Elijah class or true church similarly had to separate itself from antitypical Jezebel or the papacy for what we find to be 1260 years, uh, the period of papal rule. Uh, still in Revelation 12, six, the place prepared of God to feed the church would have been provided by they, the faithful teachers throughout the wilderness period. Now, while these prospective saints at the time were certainly outnumbered, we think they would have been led by the faithful servants of that day, picturing various reformers of the time, some of whom we'll consider momentarily. First, we'll briefly comment on one additional text on the 1260 recorded in uh, Daniel 7.25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So with this verse, the he here we think refers again to the papacy who spoke great words or boastful untruths to supplant the authority of the most high God in order to wear out or relentlessly persecute the saints that did not follow to its influences for a set period of time. How long? For what's described as a time, times, and the dividing of time. Now, for those that particularly enjoy the math component of this, uh, there's an added appreciation toward the recognition that a time uh, symbolically represents 360 years. Uh, times would be two of the times, 360 plus six, 360 or 720 years. Added to one time of 360 would be 1080. And the dividing of time uh, of 360 would be 180, which when added to the 1080 gives us the 1260 years, the period covered by the events of Daniel 725. So if, if papal power began in 539 and through the will of God was to last 1260 years, that means it came to a close by 1799. Now, admittedly, brethren have not wholly agreed as to the start and end dates for each period of the church and the messengers associated with those periods. But for illustrative purposes, we'll offer um, some suggestions as to the periods of the church when the 1260 appears uh, to us to have been in effect 
and some experiences that Christians were subjected to during different stages of the 1260 years. Uh, first, we would offer that the 1260 years consumes all or parts of the uh, following four periods of the church. Pergamus, with papal rule beginning in 539 AD, which we believe was after the start of this stage of the church. Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, where papal rule ended in 1799, which we would suggest was prior to the close of this stage of the church. And just one gr gratuitous comment about Pergamus. The Greek uh, prefix in this word per means dilution or impure. Uh, the Greek suffix in this word gamos means marriage. Thus, pergamus means impure or mixed marriage, which is what we find was flourishing once papacy was set up in power. Um, notwithstanding papal dominance during the 1260 years, there were reformers on the scene that resisted its practices and were examples to those that had to separate to the wilderness condition, even though some of them were what Brother Russell describes as housetop saints, his way of describing the texts of Matthew 24, 17, and 18. But as to the reformers, we think of Peter Waldo, who arranged for Bibles to be printed in the common language and encouraged his followers to engage in witnessing when the papacy taught that only priests were authorized as religious teachers. We think of John Wycliffe, who not only called out the abusers in the papacy, such as unjust taxation policies and interference into secular affairs, but also in church hierarchy, uh, the system of the priesthood and indulgences. And we also think of Martin Luther, who not only posted his 95 thesis in attacking indulgences, but also the authority of the papacy, as well as emphasize that believers are justified by faith in the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice. Uh, however, it wasn't until the end of the 10 year French Revolution on August 29, 1799, which overthrew the French monarchy to facilitate freer expression of thought and the I ideas for Christians. And this revolt was led through the French statesman and military leader, Napoleon Bonaparte, under whose command the papal influence was decimated at the end of the 1260 years. And as an aside, the papal leader, Pope Pius VI was taken prisoner and jailed where he later died. And then finally, subsequent events paved the way for the next phase of the days of waiting for the full establishment of the kingdom. And to that end and following any uh, panelist comments on the 1260 will be served by Brother Jim's remarks relative to the 1290. So I give it back to Brother Richie. Thank you, Brother Brian. Uh, brethren, uh, any comments uh, that you'd like to share on this 1799 at the end of the 1260 days? Brother Tom? Uh, yeah, Brother Russell uses that um, passage in Song of Solomon that I really like. It's on page um, 65 of the third volume. Mm. And he applies this to the end of the 1260. He says, why, um, oh, my eyes, who is this coming up out of the wilderness leaning on her beloved? And I think that's the same wilderness. Um, I'll just be real brief. If you look at the context, this does not have to be taken as an isolated verse uh, out of context and say, well, because it uses the word wilderness, it fits what we're saying. Contextually, it fits as well. If you study the book of Song of Solomon, you will see that it covers seven periods of a wedding. And this is going into the sixth period of that wedding. And if you go back just a few verses into chapter seven, you see what's happening during, um, during the Reformation back in verse 13. Now I'm reading from Rotherham's because it's much better. It says the love apples have given fragrance. Now, if you had to describe the doctrine of justification by faith, I think calling it a love apple giving its fragrance describes it very well. And that the opening of all things precious, new and old. Justification was not a new doctrine, it was old but it was new to that phase of the church because it had been lost because of papacy's influences. And then it goes on and on. And uh, at the beginning of chapter eight, it's really a message from the saints to the nominal church. Now listen with that in mind, when you listen to this, this is the saints talking to the nominal church. Oh, that thou hast been a brother to me who had sucked the breasts of my own mother. 
course, the mother of the church is, is the covenant that she's developed under. Nominal church isn't under that covenant. Had I found thee without, I would have kissed thee. Yea, folks would have not despised me. There's a persecution from the nominal church to the saints. And I'll stop there because I know this really isn't our point, but it really is describing what's happening during that stage of the church. The justification of faith coming out as the love apples giving new fragrance. Uh, you have things new and old being revealed gradually. And I think what we're seeing is there how the Lord works in history. He doesn't work... Uh, with isolated events. We're seeing the Reformation start laying the groundwork for what was to come in the harvest. The harvest just wasn't an instantaneous, everything's new all of a sudden. It was a gradual revealing until, boom, the blossoming of the harvest would happen. So that's all I'll say. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, any other uh, comments from uh, the panel that you wanted to share at this time? I could speak up. Uh, yes. If we consider uh, the details of what happened for 538 and 9, we only have Procopius history. Uh, I don't think we have anything else to go by. And from what he shows, in 538, the Ostrogoths lifted the siege of Rome, which is where the Pope became a civil power because Belisarius left Rome to pursue after them, the Eastern general. Then in 539, he has them bottled up in uh, Ravenna. And uh, I think he submits, uh, they submit to him at that time by trickery. And then 540, General Belisarius is recalled. So the time period has to start somewhere, 538, 539, 540. Then when we come 1260 years later, the French captured Rome in the beginning of 1798, drove the Pope out of Rome on February 20th already, and the Roman church was in chaos. Uh, in 1799, the Pope died. That was a year and a half later after he was driven out of Rome and died in France on August 29th. And no new Pope was allowed to be elected because Napoleon refused to allow it. And that continued until uh, 1800 in Mar March 14th, when uh, outside of Rome, nowhere near Rome, three foreign powers collaborated to allow the election of a new pope. But that pope was not elected even in Rome. Thank you, Brother Jim. And um, we're going to actually move to the next stage. Uh, I just want to make one quick comment. This date is so important. It was one of the real important successes in Bible chronology because the French Huguenot scholars said that there would be a revolution in France and they predicted the dates and they predicted it based on Daniel and going back to Justinian. When that took place a hundred years later, it really got people interested in chronology, leading us right into Brother Jim's uh, part of the presentation on the uh, 1290 days. So I'm going to share a screen with your uh, with your PowerPoints, Brother Jim. Good. The 1290 seems to be the uh, least obvious of these dates because all of Daniel 12:11 says is and from the time that the continual burnt offering shall be taken away and the abomination that make the desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. But what does it say it brings us to? I think the only clue we have is from the previous verse, but they that are wise shall understand. Now, oops, I think we lost something, did we? Uh, I think we may, I, I think I may have messed things up here. Okay, well, we'll try and unmess them as best we're able. Uh, hold it, we'll, we'll, we're, we're going to get back to it. Now, this is just right, so hold it there. Okay, you uh, got it. The papacy begins civil power as the Eastern Roman Empire leaves. And that would be 538 and 539, both dates are significant. 
And then the papacy is terminated, at least temporarily, by France, 1798 to 1799, over a process of time, when the Pope was driven out of Rome to where the Pope died, and there's no successor for uh, half a year. And then that's the 1260 days, and as you mentioned, those 1260 years ignited interest in time prophecy again. So eight, then now we come to 1828 to 1829 is what it would bring us to for 1290 years. But what is it that happened to aid the understanding? We can go to the next chart, thank you. That we look at uh, William Miller because he's prominent. After all, when did the beginning of the understanding of the end times begin? Well, William Miller began proclaiming a second advent message in 1831, which started a movement in the Eastern and Midwestern states. But I don't find anything notable earlier in Miller's life, that, uh, not earlier than 1831. So are we perhaps looking in the wrong place for it? In volume three, there's a couple of names suggested. Johann Albrecht Bengel, who wrote a lot on Revelation uh, in Germany, but 1687 to 1752, 1752, that's uh, too early, it would seem. And then he mentions Joseph Wolf, the celebrated missionary. Celebrated, all right. He was even invited to come over to this country and speak to the US Congress which he did, a joint session of the U.S. Congress. So uh, if we look at England at the time, they had a second advent movement starting a little earlier that some called it the secret presence movement. And the Albury prophetic conferences, there were six of them in five years time, if I understand correctly hosted by a Scotsman by the name of Henry Drummond, a banker. The proceedings were not published in 1826, the first one, or even the second one, but rather the second uh, proceedings were published in 1828 and then 1829. So now we are in the right area. So the dispensation or the age, this is their conclusions, six conclusions for these conferences. This dispensation or age will not end insensibly, but cataclysmic in the judgment and destruction of the church in the same manner in which the Jewish dispensation ended, exclamation point. The Jews will be restored to Palestine during the time of judgment. Wonderful, it's happening. The judgment to come will fall mostly upon the apostate Christian church. That's happening. After judgment, the millennium will begin. That will happen, surely. Christ will return before the millennium. Yes. The 1260 years of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 ought to be measured from the reign of Justinian to the French Revolution. Okay. Next slide. Uh, sorry, Jim. Okay. Here we go. Now, here we look at this fellow that uh, was suggested, Joseph Wolf. Uh, he, he was born into a Jewish family, but he turned Catholic, much to his uh, family's dismay. He was baptized in 1812. Okay, that's after the French Revolution by a little bit. But uh, he was arguing against papal infallibility, and so his college in Rome expelled him, the Collegio Romano, in 1818. And it was at that time that Henry Drummond took note of his arguing against papal infallibility, and they got acquainted, and he encouraged him to move to England, 1919, where he turned Anglican. At that time, there were both Anglo-Catholics and Anglo-Protestants. And uh, Henry Drummond was one of the Anglo-Protestants. 
1821 to 1826, he went out on a missionary tour to Egypt and the Levant, preaching Christ to the Jews, as well as the Christians and non-Christians. In 1826 and seven, he attended the first two Albury prophetic conferences, and then went on a tour in 1827 that lasted to 1834, a second tour to Africa, Europe, and Asia, preaching a second Advent message, which he expected would occur in 1847 at time. Excuse me one moment. <coughs> he was often tortured. We, we could go into that another time. And then in his third tour to Arabia and India and to America, it was at the invitation of John Quincy Adams that he spoke to the US Congress joint session in 1836. He was indeed a celebrated missionary to the world. And so we can go now to the next, the next slide before our time expires. Uh, there should be a little bit more to the slide than that. Did we lose the whole thing? Uh, what are you looking for, Brother Jim? That's all. That's all I have. Do you want to go to that chart you have? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read some other things first. Then. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I thought. Yeah, the rest of it didn't get copied on, but. Brother Richard, I have that. If you want me to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll get. I'll get off, and Brother Len is going to share. Well, I'll stop. One more, one more. This one is the one. one, let's see, no, one more, one more. The last one, okay. okay. As they considered one date or another for the return of Christ to expect it, the wise looked for other 1844, 1847, but What's good is they watched for evidences of Christ's return and the second presence. So when the date came and went, they didn't say, well, uh, it actually happened, but uh, we just don't know it. The absolute monarchies of Christendom were morphing into limited monarchies all since the 1260 years had ended. Then the Long Depression began in 1873, which was the first truly worldwide event since Noah's flood. The only thing that comes close to it would be the Great Plague of 1348, the Black Death. But the Long Depression was truly worldwide, all continents. And in that year, ben, uh, year 1874, well, actually, Benjamin Disraeli became prime minister in 1868, but he didn't even last out the year. It was enough that he got some training as what not to do. So again, he became the prime minister in 1874. There was a great um, famine in uh, the Balkan Peninsula in the year 1874. Actually, 1875, the fall planting of 1874 resulted in dreadfully poor uh, harvest in 1875. The Turks demanded everything they had if they couldn't pay their due, their dimitude. And they couldn't do it. So uh, in 18, and, uh, the uh, Christians revolted in the Balkans in June and July of 1875. And in October of that year, Turkey declared bankruptcy and refused to pay, repay the Christian countries of Europe. So, but the result of that was that with, uh, Disraeli told the Pasha in Turkey, you're broke, you need money, we can find some buyers for this no good land in Palestine. And so the Jews began returning to Palestine, buying the land in maybe the mid 1878, and actually returning in early November of that year. So it was making people almost ready to understand 
the end of the 1335 years, which brings us to our next presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any of the brethren on the panel want to add something additional in the way of uh, comments? Brother Richard, could I make a brief one Please. minute comment? Sure. Yeah. Um, this period, it, it was a time of purifying and cleansing and refining of the true church following the 1260 after being um, shackled to the, the, the doctrines of papacy. And the Lord's people following the close of that period could have elected different courses of life. You know, some could have adopted a study of science or of literature or philosophy. Um, they could have been uh, an atheist like, like Voltaire. Um, these were all temptations, but we're confident that the true perspective saints um, uh, exercised their liberty to obtain Bibles through the many Bible houses that were cropping up at that time to um, engage in the study of God's word. Final comment. Um, we are all faced with choices, which is personally a lesson to me. And the choice at that time was to either fight for personal rights and liberties or submit oneself to humility to the Lord. And I, I actually have an example concerning one that I think that was rightly exercised by doing this during this particular period of the church. Um, but since they're a part of my presentation tomorrow, I'll save my remarks for them um, at that time. Okay, thank you, Brother Brian. Uh, additional comments? Brother Richard? Yeah, Brother Tom. Now, there's one aspect that I've never heard discussed, but there are really two prophecies that point to this time in history. You have this one that goes to 1829, but you also have the one in Daniel chapter 8, the 2300 days that goes to 1844, 45. And they both relate to the Miller movement, which is interesting. I've never really understood why we have two. And the only thing I could think of is that the Miller movement and the Adventist movement was major importance, had major importance in preparation for the harvest, because we know that Brother Russell's understanding largely came from the Adventist movement. Uh, if you look in Daniel 8, it says the 2300 days would give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot to be released. And so, and the, how long the daily sacrifice of transgression would be ended. Well, the mass still goes on but the understanding of it has come in the harvest. Uh, so I'm a little bewildered why we have two prophecies that relate to that. And the only thing I can come up with is that that, that was an pre important preparation for the harvest and for the Bible student movement. You know, uh, thank you, for Brother Tom. And, and I think we'd all be in agreement that getting the correct understanding of the ransom, we always say that is the basic doctrine. You know, chronology is important, but the ransom is the basic doctrine. And this is, this is the period where it comes out. Uh, and uh, rather than taking more time from you, Brother Tom, it is your opportunity to present. And I, don't, I think Brother Lund stopped sharing, so you can share. Well, I don't have anything to share except my oh, words. Okay. <laughs> you know, Brother, we have the privilege of seeing and knowing what the prophet Daniel longed to know about. Uh, if you read the book of Daniel, his great desire was to see Israel restored and not just restored back to their land and released from captivity, but he really wanted the true worship of God to be brought back to Israel. He understood the sins that they had committed and the punishment that they were under. So the context here really gives us a connection to Daniel. In God's answer to Daniel, the answer was much bigger than the question. His answer drew a much bigger picture that would affect not just Israel, but in the entire world. You know, God often does that. When the prophet has a question, the Lord gives him an answer, and the answer is really prophetic, much larger than the prophet would have thought. But even regarding Daniel's desire, now that we've arrived at the 1335 days, we have seen the marvelous work of God in keeping his promise and returning Israel to her home. And we, when we read how passionately Daniel wanted that, I think we should realize how important that event has been and what it means in terms of the kingdom. The groundwork for the earthly kingdom is being set up right before our eyes. The world doesn't know what's going on, but when we understand the prophetic implications of all this, we can. So Israel will become the center of the earthly 
uh, administration. So you and I have the privilege to see that as it progresses even closer. But the 1335 days brings even a greater blessing than our understanding of Israel. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 verses 20 through 22 describes the, uh, our day and the joy that we can experience in it. This is Revelation 3, 20 through 22. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Well, those verses show that two things have to occur in order for the Lord to sup with us. First, we have to hear the knock. <laughs> and second, we have to open the door. It's one thing to know the Lord return, has returned. It's another thing to do something about it, to open the door. Uh, some, for some of us, our parents opened the door when they left the nominal systems. But Brother Russell says that the opening of the door, he, this is how he defines it. He says to open our hearts and receive the things in a consecrated attitude of mind. So brethren, the return of the Lord is not just an intellectual exercise. There are things that make us open our hearts to it. This is really meaningful. The world has suffered in many different ways over the past 6,000 years, from injustice uh, to cruelty, to hatred, to death. Mankind's, mankind's uh, time on earth has been filled with ages of depravity. You can go historically event after event to see how low humanity has gone. The Lord's return is going to put that to an end and bring all the good things that man has hoped for but has never been able to attain. So when we read the words in Daniel, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1335 days, it's not just a mathematical equation, but the words are full of meaning for us. One of the great blessings we have at the end of the age is described by Jesus in Luke chapter 12, verses 36 through 39. And this is very similar to what we read in uh, that Revelation passage, but Jesus adds one other thing. But let me read that. He says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And it shall come in the second watch, if it come in the second watch or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And here's the point. And this know, that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Of course, that message parallels to what we read in Revelation 3. The Lord knocks and feeds those who open the door to him and invite them in. But the passage adds that last feature. The strong man's house is being broken into. Brethren, one of the great joys we have in living now is knowing that what is happening behind the scenes is that our Lord is taking Satan's dominion away from him. And of course, that means great upheaval for the world. But when he establishes full control of this world, it will again mean the blessing and prosperity of our race. This should be encouragement to us never to give up our fight because we want to be part of it. The second advent has bought a great harvest as well. We shouldn't neglect to say that. You remember in the parable of the wheat and tares, Jesus said, let both grow together until the harvest. And when the harvest time comes, she'll say to the reapers, gather together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. You know, two things take place during the harvest as described here, the gathering of the wheat and the burning of the tares. I think we can all appreciate what the harvesting of the wheat means. The saints are gathered out of the systems. Jesus in, else, in another passage describes that as eagles being gathered to the carcass of truth. And so to me, the practical side of that says that in spite of their imperfections, I should value the brethren and keep working with them and keep spreading the truth and let the Lord decide when the harvest is over. I think we should also realize that the burning of the tares is also a blessing because a tear is not truly sincere. 
So the Lord is creating an environment where purity and honesty will be blessed. Hypocrisy will be dealt with and removed. And I think that should be encouraging to us. When we look out in the world and we see people lying and cheating and stealing and doing things they shouldn't do, the 1,335 days is going to resolve that. And another end of the age parable, of course, is the parable of the wise and foolish virgins in Matthew 25. It says, they that were ready went into the marriage and the door was shut. Well, brethren, if we want to be part of the bride of Christ, we have to be ready. And we have to be ready with character development, devotion, and the way we live our lives. And one last point, I'll go back to the prophet Daniel. And of course, all the other ancient worthies who left such an example for us. The book of Daniel ends with God's promise to Daniel. Right at the end, he says, Go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Daniel is now resting in the grave. But soon he and all the other wonderful, faithful men and women will be resurrected. This is actually talking about Daniel's resurrection. I often miss that point. So even these faithful people of old who were so good in serving the Lord and giving us these rich treasures of prophecy so we could know what's going on in our day will be rewarded with life. Thank you, Brother Richard. I'll give it back to you. Oh, you're, you're muted, Richard. Thank you. you uh, so dear brethren, uh, comments on this section or on uh, the wider portion of everything we have uh, been uh, looking at, but let's let's start with any comments on 1335 days that you wanted to add. And the blessedness. Brother okay, Richard. I see first Brother Obi. I appreciated Brother Tom Ruggiero's uh, focus on the joy that is ours at the end of the 1335 days. And we're all logged on here today because we found the joy. The truths that we share are just so precious to us. Um, I reflect on the re reprint article, I think it's 3800. And Brother Russell describes the history of his uh, foundation in Christianity and coming to an understanding of the truth. And prior to his introduction to Adventism and the chronology of Adventism in a very focused, uh, uh, organized, well-presented way, he had been with his little Bible study group in Allegheny, and he and they had come to the understanding of the most powerful doctrines we have, the three R's, ransom, restitution, and resurrection. He had it. And uh, when he, I think he describes going into a dark cellar of a church where a man was to give a presentation that evening. And I believe that was probably Joshua Himes. And he showed all the details of the uh, 1799, the 539, the 1260, the 1290, the 1335 days. And Brother Russell said at that point, it was as though I had now a, a framework to put the outworkings of the plan of atonement into perspective. And so I just really appreciate how the Lord has provided for his people. Uh, just a quick note, it's not really the days of Daniel so much, but then again, it is. And that is the uh, two witnesses slain yeah. in Revelation 11. And they lie dead in the streets for three and a half years. So here's this big burst of liberty from 1799 onward, but then it seems to falter for just a moment. But then three and a half years later, in 1804, the Bible societies begin to be incorporated and flood the world with Bibles. And even though people today aren't as religious as they once were, it's probably a safe statement to make that in nearly every home in Western civilization has at least one copy of the Bible in it. And I, I see Brother Richard, if I wanted to count numbers of Bibles there behind you, I would spend quite a long time talking. <laughs> But I, I just appreciate that very much. I, I thank the brothers for their comments. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Obi. Uh, first, uh, Brother Jim and then Brother Brian. Uh, I think it was Jonas Wendell that Brother Russell heard. But uh, uh, Brother uh, Tom, what do you think about it? 
it says blessed and holy is he that cometh to uh, the uh, let's see how is it there uh, blessed is he that and holy is he that cometh to the 1335 days and then there's blessed and holy that hath part in the first resurrection do you think that would actually uh, suggest that the resurrection of the saints who had fallen asleep in death uh, might have come as early as 1874 well, that's possible. I had never made that connection, but I guess there's many ways of being blessed. <laughs> and for the saints, it would be uh, to be raised from the dead. But the, the Lord's presence, of course, um, makes that all possible. So I suppose we can connect those somehow. But certainly, if you wanted to put the saints resurrected in 1874, that's not typical. Uh, but somewhere right in there, that one of the first acts that the Lord did was to raise the saints. I think that that is very appropriate. Judgment begins at the house of God. And I think also that may be when the nominal system was judged unworthy, the same time as he judged the sleeping saints as worthy. Okay, thank you. Brother Brian. Thank you, Brother Richard. Uh, I too appreciate uh, Brother Tom's remarks, particularly on um, the scriptures he read from Luke. 12. Uh, but I'd like to add this. Um, if, if we hear the knock of prophecy that is due to be understood during the second advent, we should be feasting upon the meat of this due season, fully satisfied in being fed. And we particularly need to be fed uh, with this truth today. I mean, I, I, I won't get into examples. Everyone can give their own. Uh, but we obviously live in a world with much unrest and stress. And it's easy to get caught up into that, particularly without the truth. But we should be thankful that we have the blessing of joy, the blessing of peace, which is so critically important and special while the world has been really unnerved by the many horrors um, which surround us. So we, we, we thank the Lord for imparting his spirit upon us this way. Over. Okay, thank you, Brother Brian. Uh, I wanted to ask a question, and this, this links, uh, this, is, this is a question linking to Brother Jim's portion. You were saying perhaps we should look here, perhaps we should look at some of the other uh, Bible students, we'll call them that, that were developing uh, an understanding of what we call the present truth. And I'm, I'm thinking back, you know, historically, um, when we look at history, there are time periods where it seems as though uh, all the elements are available and it's just, it's just a catalyst, let's say, that brings them together. Uh, to give an example that I know you'll, you'll like, Jim, uh, Newton and Leibniz arguing over which one of them developed calculus. You know, here you had this exponential understanding of math and what we could do, and, and it came together right at the same time. And, and so I'm looking at these different students uh, throughout Europe, throughout North America, and wondering whether historically we want to look at just one person or, or what was collectively happening within the church. That's, that's my question to you. Okay, I'm not quite sure I understand the question now. Oh, the, the, question, the question, Jim, is should we just look for one or should we say that as part of the blessing of this time, perhaps many students who had the right heart attitude were starting to see those doctrines uncovered and different uh, ones and then pull, weaving them together as they talked. Uh, yes, I think that that is true. Brother George Storrs uh, perhaps is the year one of the earliest to understand that when the man dies, he's really dead. Um, that, but it was when the 1260 days ended that brethren started looking at the second advent prophecies. Yeah. And when they did, some of these other things followed along with it. But when the dates came and passed, what they didn't see was the return of the Jews to Palestine. And so when we saw in 1875, uh, excuse me, 1878, that in fact they had started going back, we had our concrete, concrete evidence of his having begun his second advent. Okay, thank you. And um, 
Uh, brethren, any last comments before we turn it over to our chairman? Brother Richard, if I can just sure, give sure. a little advertisement. If anyone wants a kind of a detailed um, issue on relating the Miller movement and the Bible student movement, there's a really good Herald issue called the Bible student history. Our brethren have written this and it is outstanding to keep around just as a refresher on how the truth movement developed. It's really good. It's available on the Chicago Bible student website or if you email me, I'll send you one. Yeah. If you if you go to the Herald website, I think it's right there on the uh, landing oh, yeah. page, Tom. That's true, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your preparation, brethren. I think that um, it uh, it's exciting. It's still exciting to look at the way in which all of these prophecies have come to fulfillment, and what a strength it gives us at this at this time. And where would we be if we didn't have it? Where would we be?